and welcome to another installment of TED Excellence, the show in which I discover how to impart emotional intelligence onto people I don't even know. And I come to you live from my Corona Bunker on the moon with Dog Cat Fox, a Pepper Jack, and all of you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Thursday. Testy Thursday. Yes, we are back once again to the wonderful world of TEDx. Hope everyone's doing well. Hope everyone is healthy. Thank you, Mr. Tickle Trunk, for the dancing dog cat fox. Oh, dog cat fox. Uh, I want to get into this one relatively quickly. I, I'm very curious about this. I also have some little uh, preambles. So let me get into the hellos first. Jaeger Pony, hello. Corey Suzuki, hello. Mike R., hello. Officer Buck Tud Russell, hello. Nothing to see here, hello. John Miller, hello. Scanner Daffley, hello. Angela Ariaga, hello. Dr. Keeve, hello. Jose Chacon, hello. Texas Attorney General, Secret Agent, hello. Uh, let's see. Matt Barnes, hello. Some Nanyol Nation, the gay rascal, hello. Fun Time Bats, Brittany Holland, Spittle Buggies, uh, Brigid, Brigid, Brigid. I always screw that up. I'm sorry. <laughs> Roger Reynolds, hello. John Miller, hello. Zeke Weiss, hello. Uh, Nandite Rex, hello. Uh, Mike Savage, Blarg. Redneck Ram, hello. Uh, all right, so uh, the title of this one caught me. I, out, of a, out of a plethora of things that TEDx has posted in the last several days, this one caught my attention immediately for several reasons, just, just by the title. So let me read this. How to Trojan Horse Leaders into Being More Empathetic. Okay. A couple of things here. First off, Trojan horse leaders. You're, you're lying to someone. Okay. I mean, this is the implication. I don't know what our speaker is going to say, but again, the implication of the title had me going, huh? So you're going to actively try to deceive someone into doing something, right? That basically what's being implied here. All right. What is it that they're trying to do? Being more empathetic. Now, for those of you that have watched my channel for some time, uh, you may have seen a, vi a video or two in the past regarding this tool that I've seen used rhetorically many times now by people saying that they are here to teach empathy or to increase empathy or to encourage empathy and on and on and on. Uh, empathy, you know, that sort of foundational building block of human relationships. The, the ability of someone to, you know, see themselves in someone else's condition or circumstance or whatever. That, that sort of primary necessary ingredient for us to have moved along in one way, shape, or form as a species. But speakers say they're going to increase or become more or, you know, conjure into existence empathy in other people. Now, what is empathy as an argumentative tool? And I'm, I'm going to try to do this. I've done it in the past. Imagine, if you will, I am trying to sell you something. You're going to like a, a you know, a Saturday market or something. I'm trying to sell you something, right? Okay, you're walking along. You're just minding your business. I'm the guy trying to sell you something. I, as the salesperson, need to convince you that what I have to sell has value, right? Okay, you get to stand there and listen to my pitch and the onus is on me. It is my burden to prove to you the value of what I have to sell. And then you get to decide, obviously, if I've convinced you enough to keep going or buy the product. Now, if you're walking along and I say, hello, friend, I want to advocate for empathy. Now, most of us thinking people obviously know that empathy is not inherently a bad thing, right? I mean, you can be too empathetic, certainly, but empathy just as a concept is a positive notion. It is a connective notion between people, right? As the salesperson, if I predicate whatever I have to say with, I'm here to impart empathy, I'm here to bring more empathy to your life, etc. I have already told you that what I have to say is valuable. I've already put a value factor on what I have to say before I even told you what it is, right? And then in this instance, if you oppose that, if you resist that, 
well, why would you have a problem with being more empathetic? What are you, a cold person? Are you a callous? You don't want to be a callous person, do you? You don't want to be an uncaring person, do you? Now, admittedly, this isn't going to work on everybody, but as a rhetorical device, as a sort of passive guilt trip before we even get to the argument device, it's used a lot and seemingly used very effectively. Increasing someone's empathy in these contexts, classically, in my experience, means you need to agree with what I have to say or you are insensitive, right? Or you do not care or you have a hard heart or whatever. That's what it means. Is that how our speaker is going to employ it? I don't know. I'm just telling you what my sort of baseline is going into this and what caught my attention about the title. Thank you, this is Kyle. Hello, chat people and scribbles. But with all of that as preamble, let's get into this. Uh, the bingo card for today, links to the bingo cards are in the description, is card C. C as in Cassandra. So get your bingo cards ready. Uh, this talk clocks in at just over 16 minutes, so a little longer than usual. Let's get into it. Uh, start off with a few seconds for sound test. You guys tell me if you can hear this, and then we will begin. Also, Zalbla, hello. Lexi Mads is here. Now we can begin. In August 2008. In August 2008. August 2008. What was going on in August of 2008? Hmm. Hmm. Was that, uh, was that just before Obama's election? Maybe, I think. Yeah, something like that. Uh, let's see, sounds fine, says Mike R. Uh, the Dark Ages says, check your logic, yes. August of 2008. All right. I almost died. Oh. Oh, okay. This took a grim turn already. After weeks of intense neck, back, and migraine pain, I collapsed unconscious on my bathroom floor. Uh -huh. Luckily, my husband was home at the time and immediately called 911. Yeah. And paramedics came and whisked me off to Harborview, the regional trauma center, part of UW Medicine System in Seattle. Okay. Well, A, I'm glad you are not dead. B, I am glad you had medical attention as quickly as you did. I have my own experiences with sudden medical problems and thankfully having medical attention at the ready. So, all right, fair enough. There, doctors discovered a ruptured brain aneurysm oh. bleeding into my right frontal lobe. Oh, no. They rushed me into surgery oh. where skilled nurses and doctors we now affectionately call brain ninjas, saved my life. Okay, going to the bingo card, uh, circling free space. And since she mentioned her husband, that technically qualifies as a childhood or family anecdote. So circling those two on the card. All right. I was in the hospital a total of six weeks Yikes. between neuro ICU and inpatient rehab. Holy cats. I don't remember much of the month of August that year due to short-term memory loss, heavy drugs, and other cognitive trauma. Now, you also need to know that I was temporarily blind during this time. Aye. So there I was, hair half shaved off, lying unsure in a hospital bed, staring into my own blurriness, listening to the TV. Uh-huh. Okay, again, no, you know, no sarcasm or condescension here or anything else. That's that's terrifying. I've, I've had a, a small sample of what she's gone through, a tiny sample in, in, in comparison. And yeah, okay, that's that's awful. But I, she's, she's looking good right now, seems to be. Would it be weird to say that I had an amazing experience during that time? Uh, well, I guess it depends on what the condition of things were beforehand. Uh, but do, do tell. The care we received was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. All medical procedures were explained before any poking and prodding began. Everyone from the surgeons to the meal delivery staff used my first name. Ah, uh, well, okay. I guess it's the small things in life. Um, you're, you're lucky that you were able to afford all of this, by the way, because truth be told, it ain't cheap. There were no set visiting hours. 
my husband could stay there as long as I needed him. Yeah, remember those days before the pandemic? Oh, the good old days. And at a particularly vulnerable time, it was a big deal to choose my own food, okay. which meant a lot of chocolate cream pie. But um, My dog could come visit me in the outdoor garden. And no matter who we asked for help, no one ever said, that's not my job. Um, okay. Uh, you, you got a good hospital, you got a good staff, you got people who are professional, knew what they were doing, and their bedside manner was, for all intents and purposes, impeccable. I, I'm very happy for you, and I'm not being sarcastic. Uh, maybe a little waiting for the other shoe to drop, but not sarcastic. Extraordinary. Was it just luck or chance that I had the most kind and caring people on my care team? Yeah, I, I've been in several different medical situations, either as the patient or as the, you know, concerned family member thereof. And uh, sometimes it really is the roll of the dice and how things are run at a particular facility versus another. So, yeah. After my amazing recovery, I wanted to give back. Okay. So I became a patient advisor for okay. the hospital. Okay. That meant I was the voice of the patient on, in this case, an education committee. Uh -huh. This allowed me to get a peek under the hood. Okay. None of this was chance or luck. Oh. It was intentionally designed to be an empathetic patient experience. Okay. Okay. All right. Let me back up. It is chance or luck depending on where you fall at what facility and what situation and what healthcare association and so on. At that hospital? No, it probably wasn't chance or luck. It was obviously policy, training, and on and on and on. So like I say, good on that hospital and the staff for being as professional and, like I say, well bedside mannered as they were. But anyway, your, your, your mileage may vary depending on how much insurance you can afford and where you're going. Uh, thank you, Johnny Hellcat. So a hospital isn't a department store. Whoopee. I mean... She, it, it, for, for, if you've never been into a situation where you have that kind of sudden medical uh, emergency, you don't know what's going to happen, and you at least have a you know soft cushion to land on in that regard, I can't I can't uh, uh, cite her for that because when my when my eyeball when I had the aneurysm in my in my eyeball and I went blind in an eye. Uh, I was very fortunate that on that particular day, a super duper specialist in eyes happened to be doing sort of voluntary rounds of the hospital I ended up at. And he knew exactly what to do and got me treatment immediately. And as a consequence of that, I can still see out of my eye today, whereas otherwise I probably wouldn't. Uh, so I'm very thankful for that. And it doesn't happen every day, but sometimes it is a matter of the stars align. In her case, she ended up at a great hospital. Good for her. And I can't blame her for you know, finding something to be thankful in that. But again, I'm wondering where this is going. I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. See, UW Medicine, like many hospitals around the world, follows a methodology, a philosophy known as patient and family-centered care. Okay. They use this methodology to determine policies, practices, communications, training that put the patient and their family at the center of the care experience. Okay, and obviously I'm not that familiar with healthcare philosophies and things. Is that unique? Is that really innovative? I mean, obviously she's she's acting as a salesperson right now, right? As an advocate, uh, as an evangelist. Okay. I, uh... They see things from the patient's point of view, uh -huh. like with their patient advisors. Sure. And adopt policies that make the experience what it is. Okay, well, good for them. Is this going to be a 16-minute advertisement for uh, this hospital? Empathy by design. <sighs> empathy by design. I don't think that's how empathy works, but okay, you can implement empathetic policies or policies that at least portray empathy, all right? But why? Uh, because they get such awesome results, hopefully, because 
bedside manner is a therapeutic element, uh, return business, I could think of a lot of reasons why. Well, it turns out that patient and family-centered care saves hospitals money. Mm. It reduces costly errors. It reduces readmission rates. So empathy has a profit motive. <laughs> Got it. It boosts patient satisfaction scores and word of mouth. It even improves health outcomes. All very bottom line motives to invest. To in, is, is this an investor pitch? Okay. Um, all right. On the one hand, you, you can't quite, you know, artificially impose empathy. You might have policies and things that rely on or are structured by an empathetic philosophy, sure, but you can't really, you know, conjure it out of whole cloth, so to speak. Um, but that aside, being a pragmatist, if these policies and philosophies result in better care and better health outcomes, <clears throat> even if there's a cynical notion in there of a profit motive, I'm not necessarily going to complain about it, per se. Lower costs, higher profits. Uh huh. And that's totally okay. <laughs> Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. As a patient, I didn't care about why. I just cared about the great experience I had that led to my recovery. This environment enabled my caregivers' natural empathy to flourish. So it was the ultimate win-win-win for organization, staff, and customer. And how did you feel when those bills came through? I mean, admit, you know, granted you didn't have a great health coverage plan that got you out of the woods in the first place. I know, I know. I'm still cynic. Is empathy adopted for selfish motives? Any you just said it was. You just said it was. <laughs> All right, backing up. Sorry, I cut her off. Staff and customer. Is empathy adopted for selfish motives any less valid? Oh, okay. So you are, you are arguing for empathy as a sales point. Oh, okay. I, I mean, I appreciate the candor. All right. We all lament what Barack Obama has called the empathy deficit. What? We see in our world, in our community, in our workplaces. I, I must have missed the empathy deficit quote somewhere, but, and... Harkening back to Barack Obama, you're, I, I don't know, my, my memory reaches back only so far. But broad platitudes to be nicer uh -huh. are not actionable enough for people to put into practice during tough situations. Right, so you're going to impose policies and practices that, again, portray empathy, but don't necessarily make people empathetic, I guess. I mean... Okay. Uh, let me look at the bingo card real quick because I have been sort of focused on the talk. Uh, marginalized marginalization, no. Collectivize his own demographic, no. Leaves out vital context, not yet. Uh, feminism, no. Microaggressions and conscious bias, no. Anecdote that probably never happened. I believe her major anecdote so far. Uh, contradicts own point or argument. Not sure what her argument is yet, but it seems like uh, you know, a profit motive is a valid reason to promote empathy. If that's her argument, so far she's making a decent one, I suppose. Diversity inclusion, no. Attempt to coin new buzzword buzz phrase, no. Plays victim, no. Word salad, not yet. Mind reading assumes motives, no. Benevolent condescension, no. A list, mm. I mean, she listed off all the, the symptoms of her illness, et cetera. So I, I'm going to wait. She's, she's had some like uh, uh, PowerPoint slides come up. So we might get an actual list of an official list sooner or later. Patriarchy, no. Wage gap, no. Systemic institutional, um, no. Privilege, no. Self-vilification or wretchedness, no. Equity, no. Weightless example, not yet. Uh, make something about race, sex, et cetera, for no reason, not yet. White supremacy, no. All right, so we're still on free space and childhood or family anecdote. If we really want to close the empathy gap, 
we have to meet people where they are. Uh -huh. We have to get creative. Yeah. And often we as humans need selfish motives to adopt new behaviors. Uh, I would argue there's very few behaviors that are not driven by self-interest. Even things that, you know, on the outside seem completely benevolent. Uh, one's sense of guilt and alleviating it, one's sense of responsibility and alleviating that and so on. These aren't necessarily bad things or bad motivations, but they are motivations in self-interest. So yes, if you're going to get someone to do something they otherwise wouldn't do, nine times out of 10, you're going to have to convince them of what's in it for me. So, okay. So far, she's making sense. Uh, thank you, The Gay Rascal. Let's rename it Anecdote with a Slight Whiff of the Apocryphal About It. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> we'll see where we go with here, because I she, she's not making no sense so far. Empathy, to me as a marketer, has always been important to success. Ah, you're a marketer. Okay, now things are are coming aligned. Okay understanding things from your customer's point of view. So yes. you can provide the right products, services, communications. Mm -hmm. But several years back, I was left shocked and scared by questionable leadership practices all around us. Okay, such as? Our most visible and successful leaders involved in scandals ranging from DC to Silicon Valley. Uh... Yeah, yeah, you know, it's not just leaders that do those things, it's people. Um, uh, yeah, okay, real quick. Uh, thank you, Frosted Glass. I meet people where they are. It's called stalking. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, leaders, leaders are people and people are leaders. And for every scandal you hear about some high profile individual, there's a couple thousand that you don't hear because they're just either non-high profile people or people without any kind of cachet in society other than just being a citizen. So, um, okay, I, I don't disbelieve you. This is all around us. Our most visible and successful leaders involved in scandals ranging from DC to Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. Wall Street to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. All of this while at the time I was reading books to my two and a half year old son like words are not for hurting what? and trying to teach him values of compassion and collaboration and understanding his impact on other people. Uh, wh wh what are you anticipating? Perfect people? You're not going to find them. Uh, what does that have to do with teaching your son words aren't meant? I, okay. Okay. I'm obviously having a disconnect here. Maybe she'll clarify. And honestly, I lost heart. I teared up reading those books to my son. I thought, why bother? If he's just going to grow up in a world where the leaders that he sees as successful don't exemplify any of these values. Uh, I think you may have set your standards a bit high. And also, uh, for every person you hear about that's got some scandal behind them, you, you just want to focus in on the bad actors that there are no role models to pay attention to that don't have anything particularly scandalous about them. Uh, who do you, who do you identify as a perfect leader or a perfect person? Uh, I wish you'd give us an example of who she's talking about. I can imagine like, you know, the, the Harvey Weinsteins or uh, God, some of the, some of the tech company guys and all. Anyway, so because there are people out there who happen to be high profile who get caught doing bad things or are categorized as having done bad things, if we're talking about cancel culture, petty bullshit, that means that you've lost all hope for your son and the world in general. Uh, I hate to tell you this, uh, you're, you're not going to find a better world. And in fact, I'd say that people aren't exactly any better today than they were a hundred years ago, fundamentally, because at the end of the day, they're still just people. All the same weaknesses, flaws, and elsewise. Uh, the window dressing may change a bit era to era and, you know, societal shift to societal shift, but 
name me a famous hero from the past that had absolutely no skeletons in the closet. I'm sure you can find one or two. So my solution was to research. Okay. Research exactly how we could put empathy into action regardless of our profession and who was doing it. Okay, wait. Mm. Okay, there's the appearance of empathy in the absence of actual empathy. Like if you're saying that the hospital's policies and practices imparted a sense of empathy onto the patients, centering the patients, centering the patients' families. Okay. The behavior of the people working in that company or hospital uh, adhering to the policies and practices, they may give off empathy. And in fact, they may be empathetic. The problem is, is that you can't know for a fact that person is being empathetic versus just following policy. All right. You're not going to impart empathy on someone who cannot do it. You know, uh, sociopath, psychopath, you're not going to like make them empathetic. You're, you're, you had me at the beginning, you know, a sense of empathy in an organization is valid as a means to a profit motive. Okay, you got me. I, I can't complain there. That's true. Now you're weaving into something else. I'm not quite sure what. Thank you, John Miller. Not very good at empathizing herself, is she? Well, maybe she's oversensitive, you know, or sort of fatalistic about people in the world. I don't know. I don't know. Let's, let's keep going. And I was delighted to find so many examples, so much data and research that proved that empathy is not just good for society. It's great for business. Okay, well, you brought it back around again. Um, you didn't need to do that much research to find out that empathy is good for society because imagine, if you will, um, a situation where there was none at all. Uh, we as a species would have died out a long time ago. Um, there is, uh, amongst all of us, a inherent reflex or instinct to at least be pragmatic and understand we need to work together on a certain level to survive. No man is an island and so on and so forth. So that instinct alone, that sense of cooperation, that sense of community that most of us yearn for and also take advantage of, yeah, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't there to begin with. I think that's kind of a, as I said, a fundamental building block of human society and our species perpetuating. So A, you having to do research to come to that revelation seems a little nuts to me. Uh, on the other side, saying that you can leverage empathy into a profit, also not a new concept, not at all. Uh, let me give you an example. Miracle on 34th Street, right? the original, I prefer the original. Um, just as a brief, uh, for those of you that may not have seen it, uh, there is a story element in there wherein a department store Santa starts advising people on where they can find the items they are looking for at competitive department stores. Because ultimately he understood that if a person comes to your store looking for something and you don't have what they're looking for, the next best bet is to empathize with their need or desire for a thing and help them to find what they want, even if it is to your financial deficit, technically, even though you wouldn't have made a sale anyway because you don't have what they're looking for. And that created loyalty amongst the customer base and increased profits, okay? Now, you could look at that as, well, Santa Claus is just a really nice guy. And that might be so. That might be very so. But from a marketing angle, his understanding the customer's needs and helping them get what they want is also a tool, a tool for further loyalty and profits, okay? And I saw that movie when I was like five, and even back then, I understood the lesson being taught there. Maybe not in, in, in such a cynical way as I'm putting it now, but in a functional way nonetheless. So I don't disagree with what she is saying for the most part thus far. I am bewildered as to why she is packaging it as though it was something new. Uh, thank you, Johnny Hellcat, trying to find a closet with no skeletons. Good luck. Well, exactly. 
I, I'm not quite sure what she's expecting of quote unquote leaders in the world, but you take your chances. Thank you, Jago Dragon. She is selling her services as a consultant to teach faking empathy to the woke psychopathic corporations pitch incoming. So far, this has been a pitch the entire time. This, this, is, this is one of those TEDx's that so far as I can tell is just a sales pitch platform, which is fine. I've seen them before. The question now is, is her pitch going to work on me? And I'm in agreement for the most part with what she has to say. However, if she is trying to pitch to me that she is the only one who can deliver this idea to me, she's already failed. And as a business strategist, a light went off. I thought, what if we could convince leaders to adopt empathy because of them being able to find success for themselves or their brands or their cultures? Again, miracle on 34th Street, Santa Claus to the department store owner. It's been done a lot, nothing new. Uh, oh, but maybe just selling it this way is something new, I don't know. What if we could show them what's in it for them? Mm. First, let me explain what I mean by empathy. I, I really wish you would, because I always love it when people actually define the terms they're using. Sorry, I cut her off there, didn't mean to. I got I got my uh, my thumb on the space bar to pause the thing, and sometimes I get a little itchy on the, the trigger thumb. Yeah. First, let me explain what I mean by empathy in a business context. Empathy is not about being nice. It's not about crying on the floor with your employees. It's not about caving into crazy demands. It's not even about agreeing with people. Empathy is about seeing things from another person's perspective so that you can connect with them. Yes, and I agree. Again, I don't think she, she, insofar as her argument about using empathy in order to increase business output and success and so on, she's pushing at an open door. She doesn't need to convince me of that or of the utility of that notion. So maybe this isn't going to go very far for me, but let's see how she does in selling her services, I guess. It's about a method of perspective taking, of information gathering, and using that to take action, to make a decision, to communicate in a certain way. Mm -hmm. It can often lead to compassionate acts, especially during a tough decision. Yes. And sometimes it can involve feeling what someone else is feeling. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, empathy. Yeah. Okay. So you have customer empathy and then you have like basic human empathy. Let's, let's delineate them in that way for the sake of argument. Okay. Customer empathy, human empathy. Um, these two both have their uses, uh, but they don't necessarily have to overlap depending on the circumstances. Understood. I understood that a long time ago. But for those of you wondering, but exactly how does it benefit a business? Oh, well, I can't even imagine. I mean, I didn't work retail and have to put up with lousy customers and put on a nice face and try to help them with the, what they wanted, even if I thought that they were a jerkwad. I've never had that experience before, but I still made the sale. So go ahead, convince me. Here's what I learned. Empathetic leaders enjoy more loyalty and engagement. Uh-huh. If you see, hear, and value your people, they're uh, going to do their best work for you. No, really. And that's going to translate to the customer experience. Are they? One study showed that engaged workforces will yield 10% more customer ratings, higher customer ratings, and will increase sales by 20%. Oh, a study showed that. Would you like to quote that study? That's not also just sort of common results for business. Uh, okay. Empathetic cultures create more innovative products and services. Uh, automatically, inherently. Okay. They attract top talent. They retain top talent. Mm -hmm. They reduce turnover. Uh huh. One survey showed that 80% of people would be more likely to stay, would be more likely to leave their employer for a more empathetic organization, but more than 90% would be more likely to stay with an empathetic employer. Had to get your mental cue cards right there for a second. That's fine. I, I'm not any expert at public speaking. Um, again, common sense, pushing in an open door. If there's a place you work at 
where you know they're at least decent to you and don't treat you like a, a drone number all the time. Yeah. Okay. It's I, I guess the other question I have is who is this for? Right? It's not so much necessarily the content of the sales pitch or the argument, but what audience is this aimed towards? Who is she trying to convince of these claims first and foremost? And then secondarily, and I assume more nuanced, who is she trying to convince to hire her to consult with them on this notion? Which to me seems like the bread and butter of, you know, any common sense business person that isn't, you know, devoid, even a psychopath, right? Or a sociopath who's a CEO or something could probably understand the utility of feigning empathy, even in the absence of it for real. Like I said, have you ever worked retail before? Dealt with bad customers? It's, yeah. Empathetic brands enjoy more positive word of mouth. Mm -hmm. They enjoy more customer loyalty. Yes. And profitability and revenue. Yes. One survey of CEOs showed that they link empathetic culture with financial performance. No kidding. One survey showed that? Only one? I... Yeah, okay. Yeah, the, the biggest mystery of this is going to be trying to figure out who is the target audience for this speech? Who is she trying to convince? And you can look at a company like Ryanair Airlines, a discount airline in Europe. Several years ago, they implemented many uh, empathetic customer service policies to take the hassle out of travel. They Such as? Things like allocated seating or baggage fees. Uh, okay. The following year, they saw an increase in their net profit of 43%. Good for them. Empathy is not just good for society. It's great for business. Yeah, you keep saying that, and I agree. But you're not, for lack of a better word, a prophet on this subject. And if we can help leaders adopt an empathetic mindset, even if it's to advance their own agenda, the recipients still benefit. Okay, so who are the we in this, right? Because you're obviously not talking to the leaders in this. Okay, so your target audience isn't the leaders who themselves lack Customer empathy. I'm going to say customer empathy rather than like natural human empathy because that's what the difference she's talking about here. So are you talking to the office managers? Are you talking to those of us that work in the trenches at a company? Uh, and then, all right, how do we, the not leaders in a company, how do we push that idea upstairs? I have personally witnessed how doing things for good optics can transform people from the outside in. <laughs> yes, I, I talk about quote unquote good optics all the time on here. It's usually called diversity and inclusion initiatives. Hear me out. Okay. Once upon a time, I was a marketing manager and it was my job to put on events and campaigns to help our clients pretty up their not so pretty reputations. Ah, yes. You were once a marketer. You sound like you're still a marketer. But yes, you're the repairer of reputations, a PR firm more or less. All right. Uh-huh. And one of the promotions I always used to push on them was a food bank drive because it was my way of getting them to use their money for the good of the community. Uh-huh. So pushing your personal agenda. All right. Also seems like kind of a hollow PR gesture, but I guess that was your business. A semi-truck load of food would rock up to a food bank. Uh -huh. Press would take photos, execs uh -huh. would shake hands, yes. staff would unpack boxes, uh -huh. and the client would look like a hero. Hmm. And you understand the inherent cynical nature of your work and what you were doing there? I mean, I don't disagree with it, you know, if it has the results you want, all the same, but you get how functionally empty a gesture like that is just as a simple PR move. If you have to tell somebody to initiate it, but something amazing happened. Do tell. Those executives, the staff, they were now in a situation they never would have been in, interacting with people at a different socioeconomic level. Oh my gosh. They got to know them as people. Oh. They heard their stories. They yeah. hugged. 
Many of them stayed involved with the organization long after the event. Uh, yeah. Okay. Legit. You know, some things you're forced into that you don't necessarily think to do first lead to other opportunities. I get you. Selfish motives got them into the room to connect, to be forever changed. Yes. Self-interest drives everyone to do everything. From getting up in the morning to buying a tube of Pringles or something. I mean, I know, I know, I don't want to be a broken record, but it's like, okay, all right. And then? And by the way, the food bank got stocked and yeah. hungry people got to eat. Yes, okay. This is the cornerstone of effective marketing. Huh. What's in it for me? Yes. We can use this human trait to persuade people. If you've ever wrapped vegetables in bacon for your little one to eat, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, I, yeah, okay. Taking advantage of human empathy and kindness as a business tool to increase your bottom line. I mean, I, I appreciate the honesty. It still makes me a little like, disappointed in us as human beings. So it's like we have to be, you know, made to do these things and that empathy can be leveraged uh, for profit, but she's not wrong. And we see examples of this beyond for profits. Mm -hmm. We see nonprofits using this as a way to get people to do good. You don't say. It's not just about their cause or the people they help, but how will you make a difference? Mm -hmm. How can we acknowledge your generosity with a brick in the walkway or a building named after you? Mm -hmm. Now, I realize this might not sit right with some of you, and I totally get it. I mean, on sort of the idealistic level, yeah, it still bugs me. You know, the Gordon Gecko philosophy on life and everything. But then the pragmatic cynic in me is like, hey, that's the world we live in. But do the recipients care how a leader gets to adopting an empathetic mindset, like me in that hospital? Once you try it on, once you adopt an empathetic mindset, you're there, you're being empathetic. Uh, or at the very worst, you're portraying empathy. Let's, let's be honest here. If you're imposing policies and initiatives on people who draw a paycheck, and if they don't meet up to those uh, expectations, then they don't get to draw that paycheck anymore. The empathy may be, like I say, play acted. But again, I don't disagree. If the end result is all around positive, who cares if it's genuine? I talked to one psychologist who works with, used to work with autistic children. Mm -hmm. And to help them cultivate their empathy, they would give them rote lists of things to do in an interaction. Okay. Make eye contact, follow specific scripts. The kids didn't want to do it. They were being told to do it. Uh -huh. But what happened was they liked the response they were getting mm -hmm. and they wanted to do more. And Yeah, sort of like what Skinner's rats. <laughs> Again, she's not wrong, but I'm just kind of at a loss to wonder to, to imagine how any of this should be revelatory to any grown up thinking human being that isn't themselves a psychopath. Being told to do it. But what happened was they liked the response they were getting mm -hmm. and they wanted to do more. Yes. And pretty soon it did become just part of how they operated with people. It took that external nudge to get them to make that internal change. Yes, Pavlovian response. It is at the core of most of us, yes. Modern market trends, as well as the pandemic, have shown us that brands and leaders acting with empathy are winning right now. Uh huh. Those that have been there for their employees, for their customers, for their communities. The market's paid attention. Uh, the market has taken a giant hit. The lack of empathy on the part of state uh, governments uh, and our politicians as to what, quote unquote, the little people need uh, in the effort to stem the pandemic. There's actually been a, quite a, a lacking of empathy in the last year or so, as far as I'm concerned. But I am looking at the highest levels. And I know that <clears throat> different companies and different businesses locally are doing their best, and especially trying to leverage the, the connections they have in their local community with all of the 
literal oppression being laid on them by state and local governments. So yeah, desperate times bring out the best in people sometimes. That's good. It's not the way I would have preferred we get there though. And rewarded them. Yeah. Just look at all the media attention lavished on Zoom for free K through 12 access or Salesforce for extending paid family leave. Yeah, look at all that. You're right. Yeah, doing things that make people feel good are good marketing tools. You don't say. Or Starbucks for increasing employee mental health benefits. Mm -hmm. And by the way, further to that, the incoming talent generations, Gen Z, millennials, they're demanding a new kind of workplace culture and a new kind of leadership style. Yes, bringing your whole self to work. I've talked about that several times. One survey showed that 71% of them want their workplace to feel like a second family. Mm, yeah. And uh, in, that, in that notion, there be dragons. But I've talked about that several times in the past too. Top talent will no longer tolerate organizations that don't see, hear, and value diverse viewpoints. Oh, diversity. Diversity and inclusion. I'm going to take that one on the board. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of going along with what she's saying. We'll have to review the card more fully at the end of this, but uh, I'm, I'm listening for key words. I'll probably have to take more arguments for squares at the end of this, though. They're demanding respect, balance, empathy. Respect is earned. Just an idea. And companies ignore this shift at their own financial peril. Mm -hmm. As we face a world filled with challenges right now, we've got to get creative. So let's show leaders how adopting empathy can yield success. <sighs> You've given us a whole lot of examples of companies doing just that. How is it that you say they don't know this rule already? How is it that a PR campaign or a community service campaign on the part of a company in order to drum up not only community involvement, but also obviously benefit the company, that is not new. That is the furthest thing from new. But again, I will ask, who is this aimed towards? Who are you speaking to? Who is meant to convince the leaders to do this? You haven't said yet. I'm not quite sure what audience you're aiming this at. Thank you, Dark Resurrect. You go to work to collect a paycheck. If you make friends while there, that is a bonus, not the point. Uh, yeah. I mean, you can't bet on it, but sure. Uh, but you're still driven by self-interest to go to work in the first place, to get a paycheck, to make a living, to feed yourself, and on and on and on. Uh, but yeah, workplace, culture, second family stuff, I've, I've talked about that at length before. When our most visible leaders are acting with empathy, that has an exponential impact on all of us. Uh-huh. And talk about the ripple effect. You can be that model of success in your own sphere of influence. But wait, okay. How, I'm just Joe Normal in this scenario. How am I going to convince a leader who doesn't already understand this process to be more empathetic? Okay, you've talked about the benefits of it. You've talked about working as a consultant to push people towards it but you're in a particularly special position. If I'm just here listening to you and you want leaders to be more empathetic and quote unquote, we need to do that, what is it that I'm supposed to do? What steps am I supposed to take to achieve this? You got three minutes. When you act with empathy through active listening, through genuine curiosity, through practicing presence, you're gonna reap all the benefits that the research shows. Uh, that's actual empathy, not necessarily customer empathy, but uh, okay. Collaboration, innovation, yeah. trust. Uh -huh. You're gonna get more done. Uh huh. And people are gonna look at you as a model and say, hmm, I like the way he operates. Mm -hmm. I wanna find success that way. 
Uh huh. So why isn't every leader on the planet empathetic at this point after Miracle on 34th Street came out? You know, because self-interest, uh, it has its benefits and can benefit others. Taken to its furthest extreme, however, it's not necessarily productive for everybody. So what... Oh, my God. You show them that you can be compassionate and competitive, ambitious uh -huh. and kind. Uh-huh. Representation matters. Yes. What? Here's... Wait, wait, represent... What kind of representation? Like representing the customer? Or... Because I, I hear the word representation used in business in far different ways lately. She's not going to tell me, is she? Representation matters. Yeah. Here's hope for the future. Oh. There are efforts afoot all over the world to cultivate empathy in young children. <sighs> okay, you're you're treading on shaky ice now. Cultivate empathy. Empathy as you have already defined it and you want to do it in children. Okay, indoctrinating children into a philosophy always a bit of a non-starter in my book or a particular ideology i should say so tread carefully so they don't need that external motivation so it just becomes part of who they are so you're assuming that children as a default lack empathy i mean they're obviously not business leaders so you're not talking about for-profit empathy now you're just talking about basic human empathy so children are not being taught empathy. They don't possess empathy. You lost me. Let me tell you about a little girl named Yalda Modaber. Okay. Yalda was born in the U.S., yes. but her family moved back to Iran and then back to the U.S. in the late 70s, right before the Iranian hostage crisis. Okay. Yalda did not have many friends. Uh -huh. She didn't fit in. Okay. But then one day, a group of girls came to her door and asked her if she wanted to play. Uh huh. Delighted, she followed them. Yes. And they led her to a mob of waiting kids on bicycles. This doesn't have a, a happy outcome, does it? The kids taunted her by uh -huh. saying, Mom Iran to the tune of Barbara Ann. Ah, yes, the John McCain classic. They pelted her with plaster of Paris balls. Plaster? That's very specific, but all the same, ow. Yalda was physically and psychologically bullied for two more years. Uh-huh. You know what happened to that little girl? Uh-huh. She grew up. Uh-huh. Became a scientist, uh -huh. studied the brain. Uh-huh. And opened a school. Golestan Education in Northern California. Okay, so... Despite her hardships, she pushed past it and succeeded on her own merits. Well, good for her. Terrible backstory, but good for her. Um, are you going to tell us that the girls and all the kids on the bikes are all working at gas stations now? A school where empathy and compassion are ingrained into the curriculum and experience. Okay. What did her experience being bullied have to do with her ongoing career? You're, you're going to need to connect those two things together because so far I don't get it. Not just some 30 minute class. Uh huh. Kindness is at the root of every kid's experience. And Yalda wanted to create an environment where kids were so cradled and supported that they would never want to lash out and treat others so inhumanely. Uh, noble goal, but Humans are fallible things. So good for her. If, if the idea is that she didn't want kids at her school to behave in the way that she was treated when she was a kid. Okay, I'll, I'll accept that as the connective tissue here. She wants empathy to be so embedded in their identities as leaders that acting in any other way would be a misalignment to their sense of self. Okay, so now you're conjoining customer empathy with actual empathy, which you presume. Hey, you know what? 
Um, kids can be assholes. You know why? Because they're kids. I'm not giving forgiveness to them for throwing a plaster of Paris at some little girl or something, but they don't know how to handle their emotions. They're still growing up. They're going to act out. They don't know how to delineate between a proper thing to do or an improper thing to do in every circumstance. It doesn't show a lack of empathy necessarily. It might just show some basic instinctual tribalistic behavior that everybody possesses. It doesn't forgive the things that they do, but it certainly explains it. At the same time, though, it doesn't mean that they are absent of empathy, the basic building block of human civilization. So good on this teacher for trying to teach kids to be nice people. I'm not going to complain about that, but you've wavered between pragmatic corporate empathy and real empathy in this thing, and now you've gone down to the level of children and it sounds like indoctrination. It might be benevolent, but it sounds like indoctrination. I don't know enough details about this lady in her school. I'm not saying she's a bad lady for, for trying to make her kids be nice people and good people and so on. That's not it. But at the same time, the title of this thing was Trojan Horse. So you'll forgive me if I'm a little suspicious if the wrapping seems very desirable. Imagine if empathy was just how we wanted to operate. Imagine if that was the norm. You have a very, very low opinion of people, don't you? Maybe you've had some bad experiences, but I, I mean, I myself, just because Harvey Weinstein exists doesn't make me lose all faith in humanity. I don't know what to tell you. Imagine if leaders grew up like the kids at Yalda's school. Hey, you know what? I'll bet you dollars and donuts, some of the leaders that you would criticize, and perhaps rightly so, for not behaving well, did grow up in those environments. <sighs> yeah, every serial killer came from a broken home, right? It's possible. Yes. But for us adults right now, uh -huh. we need to reprogram ourselves. Oh, reprogram ourselves? Oh, that doesn't sound insidious. And human nature suggests that external motives, selfish motives, are a great way to ignite internal change. So let's show leaders what's in it for them. Let's How? By what method? What are you advising me as the audience member to do? Are we only going to find this out in the last 10 seconds? Internal change. So let's show leaders what's in it for them. Let's show them that they can be successful without parking their humanity at the door every day. A, a world where leaders who put people first profit, grow, and thrive as a result. That world is possible, but we have to meet people where they are. So I invite you to help me Trojan horse the world into being more empathetic. Uh, okay. Well, first off, the ending of your sales pitch is probably the worst part because again, using the analogy of the Trojan horse it doesn't, it doesn't engender trust. It denotes deception. It denotes manipulation. It denotes a hidden danger to the admirable outside. So, yeah, the title of this thing caught my attention and you finally using it at the end of your presentation is actually probably the biggest argument against trusting you. Not not a good idea. I'm sorry, just, just not. Everything else, if you take out the title and take out that, for the most part, she's talking common sense. She, she's relaying notions of business to customer relations that have been around since the dawn of time. I, and, and, you know, companies that have the ability to are not at a loss to understand the necessity of engaging with the public on some level that isn't just corporate based. I, I'm, I guess, yeah, the, the, the primary source of my confusion for this one is what was the point of this? If it's a sales pitch for her services, she 
didn't really promote what she's done all that much. She talked in one instance about encouraging a company to start doing food bank work. Okay, again, pretty simple stuff, relatively speaking, not very innovative, uh, not very unique. Her, her hopes for a future where the society and its leaders are all empathetic, or at least have the appearance of empathy. That's the, that's the other thing that kind of threw me off about this. She talks about the, the uh, failings of morality, let's say, or failings of ethics, depending on which leader she was talking about, from DC to Silicon Valley to Hollywood. Okay, well, what if the veneer is there, but behind the scenes, they're still jerks? Is that is that a society you would be happy about where, you know, businesses and leaders and so on are effectively just play acting, being nice people on the chance that the fringe benefit might be that people see them and go like, oh, that's a convincing act. I'm going to be like that person. I mean, I suppose in a pragmatic sense, you get what you get out of that. I, I don't, I don't know. Chat, everyone, I need your input on this because obviously I was paying more attention to the speech than I was to the bingo card, but then I don't know if I missed a whole heck of a lot. So let's uh, let's review it, shall we? Let me make sure I've got this uh, sized correctly. Come here. I'm going to zoom out. Is that uh, that's enough? Okay. So let's go over the card again, and let me update this so I can show you where we are at. All right. So marginalized marginalization. I mean, the story about the little girl from Iran. Yes, I'm going to circle that one in spirit. So marginalized marginalization. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, collectivizes own demographic. She didn't really talk about herself in some grand sense. She... I don't know. She's collectivizing the we, the audience, but not her own. She wasn't talking about, you know, hospital patients or marketers or something. Unless the audience she was talking to was meant to be marketers, but it's a TEDx talk, so it doesn't, that doesn't fly. It leaves out vital context. Uh, yeah, how? All of this advice, et cetera, and so forth, all these notions and grand ideals, and at no point does she tell us, well, what action am I, a non-leader, supposed to take to convince a leader to be empathetic? Uh, never told us. So, yeah, circle on that. Feminism, no, she never really talked about that. Uh, microaggressions and conscious bias, uh, no, and I'm not going to count the kids throwing rocks at that girl because that's not a microaggression, that's just aggression. Uh, anecdote that probably never happened. I don't have anything to say that what she told us as far as stories were untrue. So, uh, and I could believe given her attitude that she was crying while reading spelling books to her two-year-old. So uh, contradicts own point or argument. <sighs> she was very confusing in what she was talking about minute to minute. You know, when she was talking about empathy, she made it very clear she wasn't talking about like actual emotion, feeling, empathy, et cetera, et cetera. She's talking about, you know, utilitarian corporate customer service empathy. So, uh, but then, you know, she would switch or conjoin these two things together, even though she'd made a distinction early on when she got to like teaching kids and that kind of thing. And so I'm going to circle that one just because she, yeah, she she overlapped herself in ways that made it confusing. Uh, attempt to coin new buzzword, buzz phrase. I didn't hear anything new. And I'm not going to call her using empathy in that way as new either, because it, it isn't. Uh, plays victim. No. I mean, she talked about her medical issues, but she wasn't talking about, she wasn't like, you know, leveraging that for, you know, um, my, my sympathy or anything. So I'm uh, uh, word salad. I understood what she was saying. It just didn't convince me. I don't. I wouldn't call that word salad. Mind reading assumes motives. She, I, yeah, I'm circling that one. She's assuming that I guess people don't understand these concepts as she's relaying them. 
that again, none of us have seen Miracle on 34th Street or some similar example in our lives that readily embodies these things. Yeah, that's bizarre. I'm circling that one. Uh, benevolent condescension. Yep, I'm gonna circle that one too. I'm going to teach you how to be empathetic. I know the secrets to being nice to people on and on. Like, no, no, sorry, no. Uh, a list. Uh, throughout the thing, she had several lists of things people could do, or uh, in the first case, uh, the uh, uh, symptoms of her uh, medical situation. So yeah, she did list things off over the course of um, this thing. Uh, patriarchy, no. Wage gap, no. Systemic institutional. Uh, yeah, she's talking about society. She talked about, you know, culture and businesses and so on. So I'm going to circle that one. I'm being very generous today. I have to be very abstract, though, because she didn't really get down to the brass tacks of things. Privilege. I don't think she ever used the word. And I don't believe she ever leaned on the concept. Hmm. No, I don't think so. Anyway, self-vilification or wretchedness, by no means did she do that. Equity, no. Weightless example. All right, this is where I'm... The, the girl being attacked by the kids and then going on to become a successful scientist and then uh, founder of a school. Does the thing being attacked by the kids... Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be nice, sort of, and kind of do a little bit of the work that our speaker didn't do. She didn't then say... She wants to teach those kids at her school empathy so that they don't have to experience what she did. I don't think she made that connection. I'm trying to think back, but she never made a direct one-to-one -one why that story was relevant. But given the subject matter, I can't call it weightless because it did relate to the topic. So... Other than that, I'm trying to think of a weightless example. Uh, everything related to it, her stay at the hospital was sort of that pivot point for her mentality on the thing. Yeah. Oh, and also on the Leaves Out Vital Context thing, just naming off surveys without att attribution, just a survey said and this survey said, yeah. Okay, if somebody has an argument for a weightless example, I'll entertain it in just a minute. Uh, make something about race, sex, et cetera, for no reason. She never really did. White supremacy, no. So uh, that is the card as I have it right now. I will take arguments for squares yet circled. Uh, if you have them, please put plenty of, uh, or tag me in your comments so I don't completely miss it along the way. Uh, trucking with the tablet. Scribelite, you saw you were live and thought I'd... Oh, oh, saw you were live and thought I'd say hi to you and all the glorious chat people. Well, hey, trucking. How are you doing? Uh, some emulation. Weightless example. Pick one. Well, okay, convince me. Convince me, because I'm... Like I said, I'm trying to be generous to the fact that the one that I have a question about did relate to maybe motivation for what the teacher eventually went on to do. So if you can convince me it's weightless... Okay, but I'm already leaning on, it did have a relevance to the overall deal. Uh, let's see, Jago Dragon, scribe about the kids throwing things that that little girl was too specific. Um, I don't know if that necessarily detracts from its credibility. I mean, plaster of Paris balls or whatever it was. I mean, that's, that's very specific. Uh, so, I mean, if they'd said rocks or something, I... Not quite sure why play. Yeah, there, there's some there's some details left out of that story, but I don't have any reason to think that it's entirely false. I guess I'd have to look up that lady, but I don't have that ability right now. Uh, Scrappy, are the words bomb, 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 I ran a weightless? No, they're not weightless. I mean, she, again, I'm being generous, but she was drawing a picture of people or at least children who lacked empathy. Uh, they were showing their insensitivity to her situation and apparently as kids, very aware of world events, but putting that aside, 
Uh, maybe they just knew that she was from Iran and whatever her parents or their parents uh, encouraged them or, or made such comments. If it was to illustrate a contrast between not having empathy and having empathy, yeah, it it's an example. Is it a credible anecdote? I don't know. It's it could be uh, kids getting beat up on or or led into traps because people are kids are mean. I've been there, so I can't say that's wrong. Uh, let's see. I don't see. Okay, maybe you're maybe you're prepping your uh, your arguments here. Uh, John Miller, don't you teach children empathy since toddlers are kind of selfish dicks? Well, that's the thing. It's I, it, And with so many other uh, presentations where someone's trying to convince me that we need to learn empathy or something, it's like empathy is a natural human instinct. It can be cultivated. It can be dismissed, certainly. But it's not like it just doesn't exist in people by default. Uh, you know, we, we learn these things over time accidentally hurting somebody else and then having the empathy of, oh, I'm sorry, you know, grief, remorse, uh, regret, and on and on and on. The people that lack empathy are sociopaths and you can't do much about them. And they are an outlier. They are not the norm. Uh, Jago Dragon, scribe like she kept referring to getting the powerful to use their resources for others. Is that not an example of calling out privilege? Hmm, that is not a bad argument. Okay, all right, I'll give that to you. I'm more uh, more lenient on the fact that it's not a uh, immediate bingo for it. But yeah, all right. Yeah, we need. It, she, yeah, she, it, yeah, she did convince or convince. She did focus on or centralize, I should say, leaders because they can get things done. They're the important ones. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Uh, let's see. So, uh, yeah, I word salad or weightless example. Uh, you're not gonna you're not gonna convince me of white supremacy because that didn't come up in this at all. But uh, yeah, word salad or weightless example are really the only two keys here for a bingo. And again, I can't think of a moment where I was completely flabbergasted or confused by what she was saying. I was confused by who she was talking to or how she thought this was new information, but I understood what she was saying. It wasn't gobbledygook, so I can't say word salad. And weightless example convinced me. Uh, some emulation, going back and listening to the section, you even said, quote, what did her story have to do with empathy? Well, I, I was I, I hedged it on waiting to see what the rest of the story was. You know, I don't want to I didn't want to jump too quickly because maybe it would, but it did. It had to do with those kids being mean. And then she went on to be running a school where she taught the kids to be nice people. And even though our speaker didn't give a direct, you know, she did this in order that they didn't have to experience what she did and that kind of thing. I, the two things put together, that was the logic of it having to do one to the other. So yeah, that, that one's not very weightless because it's talking about, you know, human interaction and them leading that girl into a trap and then making fun of her for her origins and that kind of thing, etc. So yeah, there's, there's an empathy element there. It wasn't weightless. It wasn't completely detached from everything. And that's, I guess, the, uh, the deal. Uh, Gay Rasso, Scrabble is not himself today. He's not even having a pepper jack. What do you mean I'm not having a pepper jack? I'm totally. Okay, I don't have a pepper jack every day. It's true. You know, I'm, 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 a, I'm not quite an alcoholic. <laughs> uh, Jago Dragon, Scrabble, is empathy by design a new phrase? Um... Okay, here's here's always kind of the standard I have to ask. How many times did she say it, and did she ever qualify it with something I like to call? Did she take ownership of this thing that makes it new? Uh, just because I haven't heard a phrase before doesn't necessarily make it a new buzzword buzz phrase. If she tried to drill it into our heads, then maybe? I can't recall. How many times did she use that? 
Uh, Scanner definitely denial is the first sign of a problem. I know, I know. I've got a problem. I got a problem. Oh, Pepper Jack. Oh, Pepper Jack. How do I deny you? Uh, Electric Amish, the Roadhouse School of Business, just be nice. <laughs> yeah, and then tear out their trachea, right? <laughs> Uh, some Emily says, scramble it. I get what you're saying. I guess I just don't see how the speaker knows that the mean story was the reason for the girl becoming successful. Well, like I say, I, I am giving a little bit of credit where maybe it's not due and being a little generous. But the fact that, you know, she she the, the lady moved from being picked on and teased as a kid and, you know, abused basically as a kid by other kids and then moving on to run a school where one of her primary focuses is teaching kids to be nice and to empathize with other people when in her own childhood, she encountered people who didn't. Like I say, not weightless. It's not detached. She, did, she didn't suddenly come up and say something like, you know, it, it would have to be something that had absolutely nothing to do with her argument, absolutely nothing to do with furthering the idea. And, but it did. And in that specific example, it did. Uh, now, you could say, what was the point of the whole story? You know, why is this particular lady's story relevant to any of this? I mean, it has to do with empathy. She talked about her teaching empathy, so it's not weightless. But she was really riding the line because if she didn't make that connection, it really means nothing, right? She could have added things like, despite her experiences as a child, she believed in the power of empathy and now she teaches it, that kind of thing. So I know I'm giving advice after the fact, but maybe I'm being a stickler. But I think guys, that's where we're gonna have to leave it. Uh, I can't think of anything else that's gonna cover the bases on any other squares. And like I say, for as few examples as she gave or anecdotes that she provided, they don't quite fit the criteria. I don't have any reason to think that all the anecdotes she gave about her medical history, uh, her reading to her kid, uh, the lady who went on to become a scientist, teacher, nothing in there sounded too perfect, if you know what I mean. Uh, and sometimes an example fits in well with an argument and it just doesn't make it weightless. It just, you know, doesn't make it maybe the best one. Uh, but anyway, everyone, thank you for joining me on this. I don't know if you learned any empathy from this. I know I didn't because I already kind of possess it because I'm a relatively, okay, I'm a partially, I, I'm, I'm kind of a functioning adult. But with that, everyone, thank you for joining me. If you'd like to hear more from me or from Satsu Two Cents, you can find us both tonight on my channel, this channel, at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern for The Lords of the Night, where we will talk about the news of the day, news stories that you submit, what we've been up to on the internet, and then your questions and comments. Everyone, again, thank you for your attendance. Uh, moderators, thank you for keeping an eye on things. Everyone who donated, thank you. Thank you so much for your generosity. I really do appreciate it. I hope everyone is safe and well. If you're not well, please get well soon. Unless you lack empathy entirely, then there's no hope for you whatsoever. Bye.